Let's get started with um, something I was thinking about on the way here, because I was thinking, well, how, how do I really speak to the power of silence? Why I believe that influence is more about silence than anything else. And there's, there's kind of an interesting story that happened about two years ago. Um, my wife, uh, she's a, you know, stayed home with my boys, so she spends a lot of time looking for, you know, coupons and that kind of thing. And, and I come home one weekend, I spend a lot of time traveling, and she said, uh, Sean, we need to go buy some fertilizer, it's spring, and there's some on sale at the local nursery. So I said, okay, sounds good. So we all load into the car, go to the nursery, and if you've ever bought anything in a nursery, they've got kind of the main area, and then you just have these big massive greenhouses, right? So we start walking through these greenhouses looking for fertilizer, and we come to two piles of fertilizer side by side, and in the middle on the wall is a sign, and it's got the sale price, fertilizer on sale, whatever, I think it was $15 a bag. So my wife says, here it is. So I take, you know, fertilizer's not light. As you know, I'm slamming these bags on. I think we get about five bags under a trolley. Push it all the way up to the front, get to the till. Lady starts ringing it through, right? She's reaching over with the gun and bleeping on all the bags. So I knew it was about somewhere around $15 a bag, and I'm watching, you know, I'm just kind of standing there watching the till, and it's going 30, 60, 90. And I'm thinking, well, that's strange. I think regular price is around $30. Yeah, maybe, maybe what will end up happening is the discount's applied at the end. So we get to five bags at $150 and, and plus tax, and she goes, okay, sir, that'll be whatever it was, $175, whatever. And so I thought, well, that's strange. And I said, I thought this fertilizer was on sale. So she said immediately, she said, well, sir, the fall and winter fertilizer's on sale. You've bought the spring and summer fertilizer. It's not on sale because we're, of course, in spring and summer. So at that point, it, a strange series of events occurred. So immediately, there's a bunch of thoughts running through my mind. I'm thinking, okay, well, these were heavy. This is really a pain. You know, I got two boys, four and two. We dragged everybody here, right? Do I just pay the extra money and be done with it? Because I need spring and summer fertilizer. Another thought's running through my head. I'm thinking, well, the principle here, I mean, if I go back there, which side was that sign closer to? And do I have a point here to say, well, look, hold on a second. That's false advertising, right? Um, I'm also thinking, you know, do I even need to fertilize? Do I want to do this? You know, I'm, I'm a guy. I'd, why would I bother fertilizing? So, and there's other thoughts, but all these things are running through my mind. And at that point, and, and, and as you'll learn from me today, I, there's not a lot of time I don't have something to say. Uh, but at that point, I had nothing to say because my mind's running and I'm thinking, and I know my wife's standing there going, come on, Sean, I'm getting embarrassed, right? Do something, all right? So in the eyes of the woman who had checked me in, this is what that scenario looked like from her perspective. I was going... <laughs> and it was probably just for a few seconds, but I think in her eye, you know, when, if you were her, that would be very uncomfortable because you've got a customer standing there staring at you. Um, so I was, I thought, okay, you know, back to civilization here, Sean, let's just, let's just buy it and move on, right? I'll pay the extra money, whatever, not going to go through this again. So I was about to say that. I'm like, and she goes, sir, you know what? I'll just give you the sale price of the fertilizer. Sorry about any inconvenience. And I thought, and I looked at my wife and I smiled. <laughs> right? I meant to do that, right? And, and that was the point at which I realized influence can be silent, and influence really is silent. We'll get into a quick definition here in a few minutes. But um, now there's a bunch of things happening there. I'm not going to suggest to you that I was super influential here, but if you think about the world of the woman that was, you know, I guess taking my money, uh, there's probably a lot of stuff going on. It was a weekend. There wasn't a lot of people there, right? There's actually nobody, just us. So they probably wanted to sell the fertilizer. That's probably why they had fertilizer on sale. They're trying to get rid of the fall stuff. Um, we're coming into spring when people buy plants. So they don't want to upset me and I don't come back again. Right? So I, I'm guessing, but I assume there's a lot of stuff going on in her head. And the look on my face was probably one of, well, it was probably odd. But nonetheless, she's probably thinking, oh, I don't want to upset this guy. What the heck, I'll give him the sale price, right? And she would probably figure out the rest on her own. So I realized that by not saying anything, I got exactly what I wanted, right? Because of various factors going on, both within myself and the other person involved. And fortunately for me, you know, my wife, my, my kids were pulling, you know, come on, Dad, we got to go, we got to go. So it, it all worked out very well. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go through. I want you to keep in mind that, that each and every one of us um, has the ability to be influential. And, and I, can, uh, I can't say I know your world. I'm a guy, right? But uh, what I can do is guess at some of the challenges you deal with with other people. 
who you don't feel listen to you, uh, acknowledge your ideas and thoughts and views. They, you may feel they talk over you. I'm sure all those things are happening. And what I want to do today is, is uh, you know, a little bit of theory. I've got about 85 slides we'll go through. Um, but a few, a few exercises, because what I want you to be able to do is walk away with even one new idea that you can try, excuse me, that you can try when you leave here. Uh, and it just, I see a lot of you fanning yourself. Actually, I did tell them to turn the temperature down. I wasn't going to say that because I understood this morning it was like an iceberg. Now we're on the face of the sun. I'm, I just said, can you make it somewhere between, you know, the, the North Pole and the sun? If we can get in there, we'll be good. Um, so let's just start with a few objectives for today that uh, we're going to cover. Uh, I, I first off want to talk about the difference between influence and persuasion. They do fit together well, uh, and I'll explain that, but I, I kind of want to uh, touch on that because a lot of people get confused. What's the difference? When do I use which? How do they apply? How do they work together? Uh, also going to assess our own ability to influence others. I'm going to walk you through a couple things where you can decide for yourself how influ influential you think you are. Uh, and how you might make changes or improvements to that. Um, we're also going to talk about how you can increase your influence. I'm going to give you some things to think about and apply there. And then at the end of this, tie all this together to help you be more influential. My goal is to help you be more influential back at work, uh, but I think you'll find this will work anywhere, aka at home, right? When you want to get your own way, I think it'll work very well. Um, so let's just get started with... Um, the difference between influence and persuasion. And, and you know, before I was thinking earlier, Kate was, uh, I, I kind of came in when, when Kate was introducing the last speaker. And you were talking about affirmations. And, you know, I, I, I practice a lot of affirmations myself. Don't screw this up. Don't screw this up. And, uh, <laughs> but I want to start with something that seems maybe kind of dry, but just, just bear with me. I want to give some context to what we're going to talk about. Um, so influence and persuasion both have a common objective uh, what you're trying to do is initiate a change in a person's attitude or behavior, right? Uh, persuasion requires that you're going to communicate to sway the, the opinion of others. Whereas influence works silently, impacting the opinions of others without the influencer ever saying a word. The best way to think about this is if it comes time for election. You often vote for somebody that you've never met. And the reason you vote is because of influence. It could, well, or you just you decide, you, know, you close your eyes and you pick a box, right? That could be the other reason. But typically what happens is we receive stuff in the mail. People come to the door and promote to the candidate. You see them on TV, right? All of that is influence because you're not there in the moment with them. And they're hoping that by putting their platform under your nose in the newspaper, by being interviewed about it, by you know, kissing babies and doing all the things they do, that that will influence you to vote for them. So if you really want to think about influence, think about politicians. If you're not a good influencer, you will never make it in, in politics. Now, let's make this a little simpler. What's the difference between influence and persuasion? Well, influence is very indirect, whereas persuasion is very direct. So think about persuasion as language. What I say to you, the words that I use, that's persuasion. Influence is how I present myself. Do I look you in the eye? Do I dress the part? Do I seem like I'm paying attention to a conversation? Those are all aspects and components of influence. So you can see that persuasion and influence fit very closely together. It's almost like you can't have one without the other if you really want to be successful. Now again, influence is more about your repute, your reputation, whereas persuasion is about the language you use, the words you use, how you present those words. Influence is typically something that takes a longer, longer time to happen, to occur, right? To, to, um, evolve, whereas persuasion is more instantaneous, right? So if I was here today trying to convince you, and, and look what I'm doing here right now. So somebody got up earlier and said, here's Sean, and you know, he's done some stuff, right? So that's a, that's a component of influence, right? Uh, you would have seen a pamphlet or brochure with my picture and some information about me. That's a component of influence. I'm here right now speaking to you, trying to convince you the importance of influence and how you can practice it. That's persuasion. So each and every one of us are doing this all the time, all the time, and we don't even realize it. From trying to get a babysitter for Saturday night, to trying to convince the boss to give us more time to finish a report, to people to listen to us in meetings, 
to get our husbands or our spouses to do what we want them to do, we're constantly trying to influence others, if you consider persuasion as a component of influence. And last but not least, influence is more built, right? It takes time to put influence together, whereas persuasion is something that we often simply just practice in what we do in day to day. So why do we need to bother being influential? Well, you know, if we start Think about it in this manner, with this um, simple little visual here. Back in, I don't know, decades ago, if you look at older generations, how did their working environment, what was their working environment like? Was it very hierarchical? Right, a lot of management structure, top down, do this, don't talk back, I'll tell you what to do and when to do it. Now I recognize just some of that still goes on today, right? But that was the way everything was. Whether you were on the family farm and dad was telling you everything you should do, or whether you're working in industry, being told by several bosses as to what you should do. Now, that was kind of the past. Today, it's a very different atmosphere for the most part. Today, it's more about collaboration. So if you go to your boss and say, I have a problem, they often say something like, well, have you talked to others? Have you got the opinion of Sally or John or Frank? Why don't you get together as a team and come up with some ideas, right? So you're being forced to collaborate. And if you look at the youngest generation today, the millennials, nobody works better in collaboration than the millennials because they've grown up in social media, which is all about building up friendships, right, of people sometimes you've never met before. And crowdsourcing. Everybody heard the term crowdsourcing, right? Crowdsourcing is where, you, if you've got Facebook friends, I've got three. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, if you've got Facebook friends and you have an idea, a concept, you'll, you'll go out to your friends and say, what do you think of this? Somebody in, in my group of friends a couple weeks ago said, I'm thinking of buying X car, what do you think? Any opinions? And people start posting opinions. That's crowdsourcing. Right? We're not even going to the encyclopedia, or better yet, Google. We're asking our group of friends. So that's all collaboration. And it's interesting when you look at the differences between these two. So, my uncle, about 86, I think, spent his entire career working at Hobart's. Anybody, ever, anybody here work at Hobart's? I know you don't, but I'll ask just to make sure. So every year at Christmas, my, my dad's family get together at my parents' house, and he was always complaining about working at Hobart's. And I'm saying he was doing this up till three years ago. So he was 83 the last time they had this Christmas event. And he had been retired for 23 years at that point. And he's still, you know, my boss sucked and the work sucked. <laughs> and I hated it, it was horrible, and he'd have all these stories, and every year it was the same stories come up, right? You could basically repeat them. So I said to him uh, a couple of years, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe a few years ago, I finally said to him one day, I said, I gotta ask the question. Clearly you hated working at Hobart's, right? And he looked at me and he smirked and he says, what makes you think that? <laughs> and I said, well, I mean, the stories you tell, it's, it's clear to me, if it's not clear to you, you it wasn't a good work environment for you. I said, I got to ask the question, why did you stay there? You know, you didn't like your boss. Everybody told you what to do, right? This was in the old Industrial Revolution style where there was one main guy and everybody below him, everybody, you know, you get down your knees and praise, the, right? And he, and he talked a lot about that, but he said, well, the reason I stayed, Sean, was for my pension. I said, okay, fair enough, right? I don't have one, but my dad talks about having a pension, it's great. And then he started laughing. And I said, well, what's, what's funny? Hey, so you know what that pension is worth today? I said, no. I kid you not, $263 a month. So now I started laughing. <laughs> and I said, well, it's a good thing you stuck that out, eh? <laughs> Hopefully you can come back and try that again a different way. But, but that's the older generation, right? You probably, if you you're, talk to your parents, talk to your grandparents, they'll talk a lot about, well, you know, I, my boss told me what to do, right? But I just did it, because that's what I had to do. And I didn't like it, but so be it. That was the old way. But today, again, it's very different. You know, when I think about collaboration, I think a lot about the first time I, I was uh, made a supervisor the first time in my career when I was about 25. It was, it was about five years ago. A, <laughs> why are you laughing? No. Um, so I was made supervisor and I thought this is great, right? So I was hired on a new company, had a few employees actually in Chatham, of all places, and a few employees in Milton. So this is fantastic, right? Big man on campus. I had an office. I had my name on the door. Watch me go. Now we're really going to do it, right? So I started going out and talking to my employees and they'd say, well, Sean, what do you think about this? I said, well, you should do that. And you should do this. 
And you shouldn't think of it that way. Do this instead. But I found the more I told people what to do, the more questions I got. And funny, people didn't like me so much. Right? So my boss pulled me aside one day and said, Sean, like, you've you got to ease off. Like, have you ever supervised before? I said, well, not directly. Right? And, he, and he said, well, you know, in supervision, it's a little bit different today than it once was. Today, it's all about getting people to participate, getting people involved. You don't go around telling people what to do. So, I mean, that was really, for me, the first time that collaboration really made itself present. It really became clear to me that, wow, this is the way to get things done. And once I realized that, it became so much different because as a leader, it was easy, right? Because somebody comes in, I got a problem. I say, well, what do you think you should do? Right? Now, that may sa sound silly, and some of you may laugh because you get that same question posed to you. But the individual that's posing it, they're, they're not trying to be annoying. Well, okay, most of them aren't trying to be annoying, right? What they're trying to do is, is there's nobody better to solve problems than the people doing the work. And again, it's another lesson I learned. And un unfortunately, a lot of leaders don't know that yet. They could spend their whole career and they don't know that. There is nobody better that knows how to solve problems than the people doing the work. But depending on the work environment, you may not be comfortable or used to people saying, what do you think you should do, right? So I, I tell you those stories just to demonstrate the difference between the way it once was, which some of us may have even experienced in some working environments, and the way it is today. Now, keeping that in mind, and you know, I'm going to be honest with you, I do have cheat sheet here. I'm not perfect. Um, I wanted to do a couple exercises with you. Everybody has a piece of paper, pen? I saw you writing notes. You, you don't have to get them out yet. I just want to make sure you have them. <laughs> Administrative professor, people get their computers out, brrr, up comes the station. I'm ready to go, Sean. What do you need? <laughs> Phones attached to your ear. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to think, and, and you can just do this by yourself at first, unless you want to do it with somebody else, but try for yourself for first. Uh, take a few minutes and think about people who you feel are very influential. And I put the word leaders in there, but they don't have to be leaders. People who you think are very influential. They don't have to be public figures. It could be a boss you have. It could be somebody of your family, a friend. It could be a political figure, right? Anybody, anybody at all that you think is very influential, and try and come up with three people, three names, just jot the names down. Uh, you spell mine S-H, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, and then what I want you to do next to the name is put down maybe just you know two, three words next to the name as to characteristics as to why you think they're influential. What makes those people influential? What are the characteristics? Okay, I'm just gonna give you a couple minutes to do that. All right. So you've got, you've got two, three names, and next to that you've got some characteristics that uh, you know, kind of demonstrate why you feel those individuals are influential, right? Now let me ask you one question first off. Did you notice when you put the names down, when you started trying to think up characteristics, sometimes the characteristics were similar? Okay. Phew, that worked out well, didn't it? No. Uh, so I'd, I'd like somebody to volunteer just one name and list off the three characteristics that they came up with. And there's no right or wrong answer. It's being video recorded, but other than that, no. Okay, great, good. That's great. I plan we do this for the next 15 minutes, so I guess I'll just. Yes. Um, I heard Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey. I think she's relatable. Relatable. Yep. Genuine. Self-taught. So relatable, genuine, and self-taught. Oprah Winfrey. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Your father? Yeah. So, so if I can turn. So it's res the respect factor as far as why he's influential to you. Uh, what was the other one? Value his opinion. So you valued his opinion not only because he was your father, obviously, but because he was somebody who probably you, knowledgeable and brilliant man. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. I put down Nelson Mandela. Okay. Um, he was a listener. He was a leader without persuasion, more influential. Yeah. Uh, he did not judge. And he was a respectful, was respectful to everyone. Respectful to everyone. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Yes. Mother Teresa. Mm-hmm. 
humble, unselfish, and driven by a goal to alleviate suffering. Thank you very much. Driven, unselfish, anybody else? How many people are in the room? 150, we've seen four. <laughs> yes? I actually work on my boss and my son. Your boss and your son? Yep, they have the same characteristics. Same characteristics. <laughs> intelligent? You can't stand either of them. No, <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole different story. <laughs> different story, okay, another day. Intelligent? intelligent knowledgeable? Knowledgeable? <laughs> respectful. Yep. Okay? Anybody else? Yes? Steve Jobs. Innovative. Yeah. Aggressive. Innovative, aggressive. And focused. And focused. And maybe aggressive, assertive, aggressive, right? <laughs> assertive, yeah, and focused. Anybody else? Yes. The one common word I had was that they were socially adept. They were good with people. Yeah. They, they were conscious of their surroundings and they knew how to adapt in those surroundings. Yeah. Great. Anybody else? One more. Yes. Sense of humor? Even tempered. Even tempered. It makes you feel happy. Even tempered. He's just angry all the time? No, I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> so, just by going through, what was that, seven people, eight people? We noticed certain words came up again and again, right? Respectful, knowledgeable, you know, and I'm, I'm twisting a few of them. Brilliant to me is someone who's knowledgeable, right? Um, someone who treats others with respect, somebody who's socially adept, right? Connects well with others. So what's interesting is when we start to look at people who we think are influential, we notice very similar characteristics start to uh, come forth. And my question to you is this, if you think about those specific characteristics, can you be respectful? Yeah. Can you demonstrate respect to others? Yeah. Um, can you, I'm going to change the wording a little bit, but can you really demonstrate knowledge in your area of expertise? Yeah. yeah. And can you do that with confidence? Yeah. yeah. And if you don't know the answer to something, what would you do? Yeah. Find out or, or get somebody else, right, who, who might know the answer, right, or, or Google it. Heck, right, everything's on Google, right? So what I want to suggest to you is that we look at people who are very influential. We oftentimes want to be more influential ourselves, but if we simply look at some of the characteristics of these people, we realize that while in my own world, I can demonstrate those characteristics. I might have to be conscious of it and think about it and you know, be conscious of my actions, but that means that each and every one of us, again, within our own sphere of influence, so to speak, can be influential. Now, I'm, it's going to be a little bit deeper than that, but I wanted to start with that realization because I've had people say to me, Sean, you know, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not a good influencer, right? Uh, and the reasons typically people say that is they say, well, I, I don't really speak well or I'm shy, right? Or people don't really want to listen to me. They don't hear me. Or people look down on me, right? And all of that, if I can draw from what I heard earlier, I mean, it's up here, right? And the reason I can say that with confidence is because I am an only child that's not spoiled, raised in and still live in today, just drove from a community of 25,000 people called Owen Sound. Uh, I travel around the world working with companies and speaking, right? My parents think I'm crazy. Most people have no idea what I do, right? And I was throughout school, throughout high school and college, completely withdrawn. I was the shy guy, I was the guy who was picked on. But something happened, and I can't tell you what, but I think what really happened is when I get into the working environment, when I was young, 23 after, after college, I realized that the only way to really make things happen is to be more influential. And at that time, I didn't really know what that meant. I just knew about some of the things that we're going to talk about today that I hope you'll be able to connect with as well. And I learned that the way to get things done is to be influential, because that's how I'll get things done through others, which is what we need to do. Right? Anybody ever heard of John Maxwell? John Maxwell said that leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. I would suggest to you that although your title may not suggest you're a leader, each and every one of us are leaders in our own right, right? We're experts in our area of, of, of uh, profession. Uh, and some of us, even though we might not have leadership in our title or in what we do, we often practice leadership outside of work, right? Leading smaller groups, sports, your leaders to your children, right? 
You probably don't think about that one enough, right? You thought about your son, but, uh, you know, when we think about our kids, for those of you who have kids, you're raising those individuals and you are their leader, at least until they're teenagers and then it's all, it's all then, then you're nobody, right? So here's what I want you to do now. So that piece of paper, you, you get another one or use the same one. I want you just to draw, just like that, just two columns, two lines, excuse me, but that'll give you three columns. Everybody see that? Two lines, which will end up giving you three columns. Just draw that down the page for a second. Okay? Now, on the left, what I want you to do is I want you to just think of any of characteristics that you feel um, you're really good at. Any of those characteristics around influence that you think, wow, I'm good in speaking to other people, uh, I'm uh, a leader in my own right, I present myself well, whatever it is for you, okay? And, and what I want you to do as we're going through this is think about somebody you want to influence. Okay, so maybe I should have said that first, but put in the back of your mind somebody you want to be influential with. It can be anybody. It could be your boss, a coworker, a friend, whoever it is. And with that in mind, okay, keep that in the back of your mind for now. On that left column, right over here, I want you just to note some of the characteristics that you think you possess that make you influential. Just give you a minute to think about that. Okay? Now down the middle, right, number two, down the middle column, think about this individual that you want to be influential with. And think about your reputation in the eyes of this person, your experience as it relates to your interactions with this person, the knowledge that you possess relative to your interactions with this person. And I want you just to list some things that come to mind that would support you in being influential. So for example, you might say, you know what, uh, I've got great experience in X area and this person I want to influence needs that experience. So just think about those kind of things as it relates to this individual. Think about your repute, your experience, your knowledge, and how it might support you in being influential. I'll just give you a minute to do that. Okay? Now, last column, far right, column number three. What I'd like you to do is list the challenges that that individual is facing today. And if you're unsure, guess. Think about that person, their environment, whether it be at work, at home, whatever you know about them, and list any of the challenges you think they might face day to day. All right. So let me ask you a question. Which one of those three columns is the most difficult? First one? Second one? Third one? <laughs> now, obviously, it depends on how well we know the individual, right, that we're thinking about. But what I want to suggest to you is this. Oft times, if we want to influence somebody, and don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting you sit at your desk, whoops, I'm not suggesting you sit at your desk one day and say, you know what, I'm going to influence that person. It doesn't really happen that way, right? Uh, but, well it, well, it might, but no. Um, but what often happens is we think, okay, you know, I need something. I need that person to do something. I need some information, whatever it is. And so we kind of reaffirm within ourselves, well, you know what, I'm a likable person, right? People usually give me what I want if I ask nicely. Right? Well known, well liked. That's the characteristics. That's the left. Right? Then we go to the middle. We think, well, I gotta go to this person. Let's call him John. I gotta go to John. Well, I know John fairly well. I've worked with him for some time. I mean, he knows I I do good work, right? I'm fairly intelligent relative to this topic. Uh, so I think he's gonna look at me and understand why I need this. So I think he'll support me. And that's where we stop. And then we go to John. And then we ask John for what we want, and if we're lucky, John gives it to us. A lot of times, maybe he doesn't. We get upset, and we say, wow, I wasn't very influential. I wonder what happened. We often work from the left to the right, but where you need to start if you want to be powerful as an influencer is on the right. And I'll tell you why that is. I had, for a career of about just almost 18 years, I worked in eight companies in 10 roles. Uh, I, I did a session on uh, a Tuesday in Ridgetown, of all places, and they wanted me to write out my career path. And when it was done, they said, holy cow. I said, holy cow. It looked horrible, right? I, I had to start my own business because nobody would hire me because my resume was 16 pages. <laughs> but what I learned during that time is that 
you know, as I moved into new companies and new roles, and these weren't all the same role, these were different roles, from one department to another, but what I learned is I never really needed to know what people were doing. I didn't need to be able to sit down at your desk and do what you're doing. I needed to spend time focusing on the people, what's important to them, what matters to them, what's going on at home, what are the challenges at work, right? And I'm not saying I would pry into people's personal lives, but I showed an interest, I showed attention. And if I did that, as a leader, that's all I needed to do. So then I built a trust and rapport, and if I needed people to do something, they trusted me, just like I trusted them. So the way I did that was I always focused on that right-hand column, and it took some time to realize that. I don't need to think too much about myself. If I think about the other person, what's going on in their world right now, in their life, and sometimes I don't know, but if I can take some guesses here, wow, I'm probably in a much better position to try and get what I need, right, and be influential. So if you want to be powerful relative to influence, start with the right-hand column. Start thinking about the other person's world because I guarantee you, when you approach them, when you speak to them, it, you will use language and words that support their challenges in their world rather than look like it's serving your world, which already puts a barrier up between us and the other individual. So here's the next thing I want you to do. Uh, and this is going to, we're going to do this in two stages here, okay? Uh, I want you, does everybody in the room know everybody else super well? <laughs> I heard one person say yes, I heard people, okay. Uh, I'm going to assume that there's somebody at your table that you don't know super well. And that might not be the case for every table, but I assume most tables, there's a couple you know and a couple you don't. Is that a fair assessment? Okay. Um, so what I want you to do is this. Take a minute, look at somebody either at your table or maybe right behind you or beside you, very close to you that you don't know or you don't know well. And I just want, I'm gonna give you five minutes, not even five minutes, three minutes, just to have a quick conversation with them, but whatever the heck you want. So you can start with an introduction, right? If you don't know them, and take it from there, okay? Two, three minutes tops. Everybody ready? Okay, go. Everybody just pause for just a second. Everybody good? Did you pick one person? No, I just talked to the table. Yeah. Okay, that's okay. It's all right. We got the rowdy bunch down here. Would this be the east or the west? It's my it's my west. The west end. Can the west end hold on a second? See, they knew it. The west, east, west. I didn't know what to call you. The west versus east, from where I sit. Um, Okay, so you had a few minutes. Ho hopefully you, you spoke with someone, right? Uh, I know you probably spoke at the table, uh, which is fine. So here's what I want you to do now. Think about something that you're passionate about. Uh, it could be a hobby. Um, try and stay away from the, the, the really common stuff. Like if you say, I love my kids. Well, 99% of people love their kids, right? <laughs> But think about something different. Maybe you like to cook a certain food. Maybe you like to skydive. Maybe you race cars in the weekend. Think about something that's maybe a little bit different than what most people might have. Most of us, right, uh, do something that's maybe a little bit different than others. Think, everybody got that in their mind right now? Okay. And nothing, like, don't get too, like, kinky or anything, right? Don't. <laughs> On the weekends, I like to. Uh, was that inappropriate? When I showed up earlier, I came to the table and the lady said, you must be Sean. And I, I said, yeah, how'd you know? She said, there's not too many guys here. I said, okay. yeah, fair enough. Uh, okay, so you've, what I want you to do is this. You've got that in mind. Now, this time you will have to pick one person, okay? I don't, I don't want you to talk. I mean, you don't have to move, but I don't want you talking across one another. I want you to pick a partner, pick somebody that you connected with a minute ago. And I want, I'm going to give you five minutes, which is two and a half minutes each to convince that other person of why they should take up your passion or your hobby. Okay? Ready? Go. Time's up. Time's up. Hello. Hello. I can't whistle, so. You, you had to, I'd end up slobbering all over everybody. Wouldn't you? East side, west side, South side. Okay. Everybody good? So here's what I want to ask you now. Here's what I want to ask you. Who was convinced to at least try or, or maybe even just consider further 
what the other person suggested to them. Raise your hands. So about, maybe about half the room. Can I have a volunteer to tell me what it is that they're thinking and trying? Yes, ma'am. Running. So who runs? You're a runner? I ran all the way from Brampton, so I know all about running. So you're a runner, and you're convinced that you should maybe try running. Yeah. If you can walk, you can run, right? I mean, it, we're better at running when we're younger because you go to the bar and as a guy and you run, right? Now, you got kids, you can't run because you lose the kid, right? Okay, so you were convinced to run, to try running. Exactly. Running is fast walking, right? Ultimately, absolutely. Anybody else? Yes? Um, Sandy here convinced me to uh, vacation in Florida. To vacation in Florida. <laughs> nice. I was, my, my suggestion, wait till March. I went in January this year, and we went to Legoland, and my boys had toques and jackets on. It was horrible. Coldest day of the year, and here we are in holidays in Florida. It was great. Still, no snow, though. Uh, yes? You're going to be a Detroit Red Wings fan. Excellent. Excellent. Anybody else? Uh... Nobody in the East End? West, okay, yeah. Um, Rosemary convinced me to be a world traveler and to see many countries. So you're convinced now to become a world traveler and see many countries. Now, is she going to pay for that? <laughs> that would have been, that's the next level, right? Uh, if you're like a 16-year-old child, you can just get in the wheel well of the plane and travel that way. If you read that in the news, right? Um, okay, so of those of you that were convinced... Give me one thing that the other person did that convinced you. Tell me one thing. Anybody at all. I don't care whether you volunteered your example or not. One, yes. Overcome Enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. What, sorry, what was yours? Overcome fear. Overcome fear. Yeah. So they talked you through your initial fears? Uh, I think the fear was on the other side. The, oh. And uh, it actually convinced me if you could do it, I could do it. Ah, excellent. Anybody else? Yes. What's that? Spoke with passion. How would you know that? Her body language? Was she looking at you in the eye? Tone of voice, right? She looks embarrassed right now to be passionate. <laughs> Head down, right? Over here, somebody. She took your word. Well, stop it. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, so she set, a, set and exceeded a goal. So that convinced you that you could set a goal as well? Is that it? Okay. Anybody else? What convinced you? Sandy made it really attractive, offering lots of incentives. She l offered incentives. <laughs> Coupons, right? <laughs> so here's what I want to suggest to you then. Uh, if you think about that exercise, uh, you were convinced based on the other person's body language, how they presented themselves, right? That's influence, as well as what they said, which is persuasion. So you've just done something where, at least in half the people here, you've been persuaded, influenced to try something new. So it's not that difficult. But what you had to do, I had to give you instructions as to what to do, which meant you had to take a minute and think about it. But day to day, we're just being us, right? We're not really stopping and thinking. I need this, and they don't give it to me. Well, what the hell, right? I needed it. Why didn't you give it to me, all right? We're not stopping saying, hold on a second. What's their world like? What should I, how should I best present this so it's going to be successful? Do I look the part? Am I, am I going to make sense? Right? So a few things I want to cover with you before I wrap up here. Um, if you think about how can I increase my influence, as I've mentioned all along, influence and persuasion go hand in hand. And if you look at the, the, the photo you'll see up there in the, uh, on the screen, influence underlies everything we're doing, right? But what I really want to hone in on here is relative to persuasion, what we want to do is focus on, number one, our message. Number two, the context of our message, right? That's how we're going to position this and how well the other person's going to respond to it. The value the message has. If I went to, uh, 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 let's say there, I'm in a waiting room of the doctor's office and there's a mother there with four kids running around like crazy and she's just trying to hold them together and I walked up to her and said, hey, do you mind holding this? I got an appointment. Versus I walk up and say, you know what, uh, you've got to go to an appointment, uh, you know, if you want, my, my boy can play with your boy and I can kind of keep an eye on them if you want, right? Not trying to be creepy, but, right? 
<laughs> because I'm thinking, so I always want to think about the value my message has in the eyes of the other person. And the last is my deliver E, if you look at the slide actually, <laughs> uh, the deliver E, uh, how I deliver the message. If I need something, maybe it makes sense that I pull the person aside. Maybe I want to wait till the end of the day. Maybe I don't want to do it in the middle of a meeting. I better to talk to them after. Um, and, and the last thing I want to kind of cover here is the principles of influence, okay, really quickly. Uh, and, and I want you to keep these in mind because they, they play a part at different times, and I think you'll realize when you can use them. Uh, reciprocity, uh, you ever wonder why Easter Seals used to send you tokens in the mail and then ask you for a donation? Because the theory of reciprocity is you give to get, right? That's why people give you, co companies give you calendars and coffee mugs because they're going to keep their name in front of you and maybe you'll help them out someday. A commitment. If you have a viewpoint but you waver from that commitment, that's going to impact how influential you are. Think about a politician who tells you, I'm going to cut taxes, and then they get elected and they don't cut taxes. Chances are they're not going to get elected next time, right? Uh, the third one is acceptability. Uh, have you ever heard uh, the phrase, if you can't beat them, join them? Right? It's that kind of idea. What I want to do, if I'm thinking about putting my message in the best context, I'm trying to make my message, my positioning of myself acceptable in the eyes of the other person. And their world might be a little bit different than mine. The fourth is authority. Right? And there's nothing that drove me nuts more growing up than my parents saying I couldn't do something. You know, can I go have a sleep over at John's house? No. Why? Because. And as I got older, I'd say, well, because isn't an answer. And then my mom would say to me, because I'm older than you, I'm your mother, and you will do what I say, right? She was using authority to be influential. So there are times when authority makes sense. And the last is scarcity. Uh, you ever gone to buy furniture, and there's a, a furniture company, you know, the brick, and you notice that there's a sale on, and it ends Friday at midnight. Midnight, 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 right? And then Saturday morning at 7, there's a new sale. Right? Same stuff, different stickers, same price, but it's only done until Sunday at noon. And then Monday morning, there's another sale. What they're doing is practicing scarcity. And you can practice scarcity. Let's say your boss comes to you and says, I need this report done today. It has to be done by the end of the day. Well, you know if they want it today, they actually need it tomorrow or well beyond tomorrow. And if you're really busy today, scarcity might be where you say, you know what, my day is packed, but I've got 15 minutes first thing tomorrow morning. If I have a look, I might be able to squeeze it in you're practicing scarcity, right? So you can practice all of these principles in what you do day to day. And I can't stress enough the importance of thinking about the other person's world and what's in their best interest, right? That's critically important. Now, before I wrap up, if I can keep you two minutes longer, I'd like to give you an example of this, okay? I, uh, I, went, I, I wanted two years to go buy a snowmobile. And my wife said, you know my wife? <laughs> so I said, well, I'm going to go look. I'm just going to go look at it. That's it. I took my four-year-old, went and looked, loved the snowmobile, decided to buy it. So I put my four-year-old, he wanted to sit on it. He, he sat on it. My wife texted me around that time and said, when are you coming home? I took a picture of him and texted it back and I said, look what Matthew bought. <laughs> I, I told him you said no, but he still bought it. So if you think about what we've talked about today, and that's my example of being influential because, you know, to this day she rides it and she loves it, right? All the things that we talked about today, we talked about why influence is important, how influence and persuasion can support achieving your objectives, whatever they are, day to day, month to month, year to year, and ultimately how you can increase your influential power. So the last thing I'll say is this, that if you think about influence and persuasion, if it's easier to think about it in this manner, think about yourself as a salesperson. And each and every day you're selling your views, your opinions to others, and that takes effort. Salespeople don't fall into sales, they put a lot of effort and work into sales. And if you want to be influential, if you want to get what you need, you have to put work and effort into achieving those outcomes using some of the things we talked about today. So with that, I want to thank you very much for having me, uh, and have a fantastic day. Thank you.